So we had eigenvalues, eigenvectors. Was that whole idea of can you solve a times x is supposed to be lambda x, right? And so finding specific lambdas with associated vectors that go along with it um, and working those out. How do you solve those? How do you find the lambdas? What do we do? We take the determinant of what? If I asked for the eigenvalues of a matrix, what would you do? You would subtract lambda from all the diagonals and then find the characteristic polynomial, which is take the determinant and it spits out a characteristic polynomial. You set it equal to zero. You find your lambda. Those are the eigenvalues. How do you get the eigenvectors per eigenvalue? Right. Plug that lambda value back into the, as that minus lambda, which gives you a new matrix, and then you find the null space of that matrix, and that will tell you the eigenspace and with the vectors that go along with it. So we that's calculation based, right? Now on the other hand, applications of eigenvalues and eigenvectors that we covered last time was systems of linear differential equations solving this idea of a y prime is equal to a y, which is a first order system of differential equations. In other words, what we had here was y prime, which was y1 is a function of t, t, y2 is a function of t, all the way down to yn is a function of t. This could be a bunch of functions that I'm trying to find the solution to. I would take its derivative. It's the same thing as a matrix times y1 as a function of t, y2 as a function of t, all the way down to yn as a function of t. And when I say solve, I mean y1 of t equals what? y2 of t equals what? Etc. Find all n functions, and we normally solve this, keeping those functions in a vector for each of it. So solving differential equations means finding equations. And it ended up being that solving this is straightforward, right? All we would have to do is the thing that would determine the types of solutions was the matrix A. And so solving it, we didn't have to do anything at all after you do all of the work to solve it without being given specific functions, y1, y2, or specific values for A. We would just simply say, hey, look, the solution is going to be exponential. And it ends up being that the solutions for this particular type of problem, uh, what you would do is for A, find the lambda i with eigenvectors x sub i. And if we have linearly independent x sub i. If they're not linearly independent, that's going to be one of the sections that we're not covering. But if we have linearly independent eigenvectors, then the solution is simply that y, which is all of the, right, written as y1 of a function of t, y2 is a function of t, all the way down to yn is a function of t, we just simply call y, we store it as a vector, is going to be c1 e to the lambda 1 t x1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t x2 plus cn e to the lambda n t xn. So we can just jump straight to the answer. We just go ahead and say, okay, everything is exponential. All we have to do is write it in this particular form. 
Now, on the other hand, if you wanted to find y1, y2, yn, x1 is a vector, right? So it has, y1 has whatever component of x1 times e to the lambda 1t, and the ci are just constants. The ci can be determined as, as a specific, right? If it's an initial value problem, <coughs> In other words, where you're given that y evaluated at 0 is just some sort of vector y0. They just tell you at plug 0 for in all of your t's and you're given a specific value. If you do that, you can go ahead and find, you can find c1 equals c2 equals, etc. cn equals for specific. solution. So we just simply jump straight to the general solution by just simply writing out the answer. If you have your lambdas and your x's, you can just write it that way. On the other hand, if it's an initial value problem, you're given your starting values at time zero. What are all the function values? If you have that, you get an equation so you can solve for each of the constants. So all we have to do is know that we can do linear combinations of exponential solutions. So example. So y prime was equal to a y. And we were told that y evaluated, the functions evaluated at 0 all spit out 1. Right, I'll just do that. So I said the first function evaluated at 0 was 1. The second function evaluated at 0 was 1. The third function evaluated at 0 was 1. <laughs> And I have some sort of matrix A here, and so you do all your work. You find the eigenvalues plus vectors on A. So obviously this is a lot of work. Which is a problem amongst itself, right? That's an entire section. So you do two pages worth of work, and you do all these things, and you find the lambdas, you find the x's and it spits out that the first lambda that you found was say one and its corresponding direction was one zero zero you found that the second lambda that you found was say negative one and its direction was say zero one zero and then you found that the third one you found was say half and it was in the direction of 0, 0, 1, right? So all, you did all this work magically, and there's your answers, right? We just simply went through it and said, or if you wanted to, because this was a, a system of differential equations that you were not interested in actually doing eigenvalues and vectors by hand, you just threw it through a solver, right? And spit out these three <coughs> solutions, the three values with their corresponding eigen vectors. If that's true. That means your solution. So once you do all of that work, all we have to do is write down this solution. So what is y? y, which is made up of a function of t, a function of t, and a function of t, right, is simply going to be something times e to the value, which is 1t, times the vector 1, 0, 0 plus something times e to the value, which is going to be minus t, times 0, 1, 0. And then plus something e to the value times t times its direction, 0, 0, 1. So we did, right? All you do is it's a constant times e to since this is a 1, that's a 1, this is the vector, it goes right beside it. That's all we have to do. It's e to the value t vector, e to the value t vector, e to the value t vector, and we just simply write that out. Now I could go ahead and just simply stop, right? But most people would look at this and say, I probably want to, I'd like to know what y1 is. And so you could multiply it out, we would have y1 of t, and then y2 of t, and then y3 of t is equal to, if I just take all of these and multiply it out since those are zeros, this is really just simply c1 
e to the t zero zero plus zero c two e to the minus t zero plus yes I'm being really silly on my c three e to the one half t right. I just made it as simple as possible so that when I look at this, it's not that hard to write. And then we have that y1 of t, y2 of t, y3 of t. Just simply, let's go ahead and add them. That's c1 e to the t, c2 e to the minus t, c3 e to the one half t. So what's my first function? What's y1? Some constant e to the t, right? It's just an exponential curve. What's my second function? Some, some e to the negative. Right, so that's an exponentially decreasing curve. And then my third one is some constant e to the half t, which is an exponentially increasing curve. And so you could write it this way, right? What's nice about this is you can say what each of the functions are if you needed it, right? If this was a mixing problem and it was like that mixture of tanks, right? The first would be what's the salt value in the first tank over time? It's exponentially increasing. What's the salt value in the second tank? It's exponentially decreasing, right? What's the salt value in the third tank if it was a mixing problem of some sort? On the other hand, these are equal, right? So you could have just simply wrote this here and said this is my general solution. It's some constant. You could have just left it like that if you want. What's nice is a lot of times you want to have specifics. You know, like, well, what functions are you talking about? Well, let's put it all together. And then we can see what y1, y2, and y3 are. Now, on the other hand, if I was given initial values, let's say we had that right there. Let's say I was given that y evaluated at 0 was supposed to be 1, 1, 1, right? Well, what is this 0? That says t is equal to 0. That tells me if I plug in zero for all of my t's, what thing is supposed to come out? One, one, one. And so that would tell me if I plug in zeros everywhere, that is c1 e to the zero, c2 e to the minus zero, c3 e to the one half of zero is supposed to be one, one, one. Well, what's e to the zero? One. So what does that tell me that c1 is? What's c2? What's c3? And so my specific solution, so the initial value solution is rather y, instead of, I don't want to write that, it would have been just simply e to the t, e to the minus t, e to the one half t. Those three functions. And then you would write it that way. So there's nothing that jumps out in terms of the big new stuff here is simply can you find an eigenvalue and can you find an eigenvector? And then all you have to remember is how do I write this answer? And this answer works as long as those vectors are linearly independent. And all these problems will be linear independent solutions. Is everybody okay with, I mean, that, that one's, you know, probably overly easy. I probably should have picked some better vectors, but make it, which would make the C1, C2, C3 a little bit more complicated to find. But. Is everybody okay with that example? All right, one of the questions we could have is everything I've done so far, like on that example, the example of the mixture of salt problem in the, in the book was everything that had real valued lambdas, right? Now, this solution, this idea of if y is equal to ay, and then what do we do? Step one, we find a's lambda i x of i, right? And then two, the answer, the solution, we just simply write the solution. y was equal to C1 e to the lambda 1 x1 plus C2 e to the lambda 2 x2 plus Cn e to the lambda n xn, right? Which these are all linearly independent 
and then we would just simply drag, drop to the solution and we're done. So simply e to the number, let t eigenvalue, eigenvector. e to the eigenvalue, oops, t, t, t. Forgot all my, these are all functions of t. And so we just jump straight to the solution. Now this works for any restriction, nothing in terms of like the complex values, right? So one of the questions I could have is what would happen, for example, let's say we had y was equal to, say y prime is equal to ay, and the first thing you found was lambda 1 is equal to 1 plus i with x1 was equal to a i and 2 plus i. Um, Knowing that, what would what would lambda two automatically be? Be one minus i, and what would x two be? What's the complex conjugate of i? Because i is really what zero plus i. So what's this complex what's this complex conjugate? Zero minus i. So that would be minus i, and what would be the other one? Two minus i. Right. So we just if you know one, you know the other. Okay, how would I write my solution? So two, what's the solution? The solution is going to be y is equal to what? A constant, e to the one plus i t times an i over two plus i plus a constant e to the one minus i t times negative i to minus i. Now if you look at this, you might want to kind of thump your head a little bit and say, that doesn't look pretty. I don't like having like 1 plus i up in the power of an exponential, right? One, thing, one of the things that we could take advantage of, now this is a solution, we could just go ahead and stop. But it's not kind of a typical way of looking at the solution. <coughs> So you can just take this problem. Do you notice that this problem is exactly like the problem above? There's no difference. Right? I just need to know where to write things down and I have my solution. On the other hand, can we write complex solutions, basically <coughs> complex lambdas, in a different way. All right. What we're going to do <laughs> is kind of play around with them a little bit and take advantage of what an exponential, because Exponentials of complex powers can be written as what? And we know what e to a complex power, e to the i right? In other words, e to the i pi's, right, are actually what? Sines and cosines, right? So a complex exponential function can be written as a real component trig with an imaginary component trig. That's one of the properties of these transcendental functions. So uh, if A has, say, lambda is equal to A plus BI with corresponding vector X. Well, Lambda is resolved into a real part and then an imaginary part. Like this would be, it's the real part of lambda. The B is the imaginary part of lambda, right? Complex numbers have a real component and an imaginary component. What's the imaginary component? The thing with the I. If that's true, x itself can actually be broken up into the same thing. It could actually be written as a real component for the stuff 
and then an imaginary component of the thing. So for example here, this, what would be the real part of x? What's the real part of the top? Zero. What's the real part of the bottom? What would be the imaginary part of this particular x? What is the imaginary part of the top? One. What's the imaginary part of the bottom? One. So in the same way, I could collect just the real stuff and the imaginary stuff and just use i as a label. So we can do that. Now, obviously, we still have lambda bar, which is equal to a minus bi. But we're also going to have x bar. But x bar is easier to write. It's just the real part of x minus i, the imaginary part of the original x. Right? That's the only difference. It's just simply, where if you had a plus before, you have a minus now. Just flip it. Now, we are going to have two solutions. So we would have linear combinations of, so we have, we have two solutions that we normally do in linear combinations. We have one solution, I'll call it y1, is equal to e to the lambda t x. And then we have another solution, y2, which is equal to e to the lambda's complex conjugate and the complex conjugate of that guy. These are both solutions. And normally what we would do, what we, what we would do is just simply say y all solutions all solutions are just simply e to the lambda t x plus a constant times e to the lambda bar t x, right? We just simply take any linear combination is a solution. That's all we did before. This is all I did was write this here is exactly what I did right there. I'm going to use this for a second and say, hmm. So any linear combo of y1, y2 are solutions. So I'm going to make two different solutions and I'm going to use a little fact. Fact. A plus BI plus A minus BI is what? Two A. A plus BI minus A minus BI is what? Two B. Right? But that would tell me that if I took this 2 to the other side, the real part of anything, right? So the real part of a complex number is half the sum, and the imaginary part is half their difference. Forgot my eye. everybody okay with that? The real part is half the sum. The imaginary part is half their difference. It's just a, a property of the fact that they're complex conjugates. What happens when I add and subtract them? So I'm going to do the following thing. So this is the real part. That's the real part. And this guy right here is the imaginary part. Now I'm going to look at that for a second. What's going to happen? So we look at that guy here. So what would happen if I would take e to the lambda t 
x plus e lambda minus t x. And then take one half of that. That is simply going to spit out e, the real part of e to the lambda t x. The real part of the first solution. On the other hand, if I would take one half of e to the lambda t x minus e to the complex conjugate solution, I will simply get the imaginary part of e to the lambda t x. Now, because this is a solution and this is a solution, I took a linear combination of those two solutions, which means that it's a solution. Since this is a solution and this is a solution, I took a linear combination. I took half of the first plus half of the second, half of the first minus a half of the second. So what I've done is, what happens if I put a half here and a half here? That spits out the real part only. What happens if I put a half here and a minus half here? It spits out the imaginary part only, and both of those are solutions. And why am I interested in that? Well, what is e to the lambda tx if I want to write it the long way? This is e to the a plus bi times tx. But a plus bi is simply e to the a times the cosine of b t plus i sine b t. That's that. This is e to the a, e to the b i, which is cosine i sine. And then all times x, but x can be resolved into a real part and then an i imaginary part. And so that's a complex number times a complex number. So what we would have is we could Let's take our two new solutions. We're going to take the real part of e to the lambda tx, and I'm going to call that, say, y1. We're going to take the imaginary part of e to the lambda tx. We're going to call that y2. And these are new. These are new solutions to use as our linear combination. And what will those things look like? Well, the real part will be the real times the real minus the imaginary times the imaginary because that's i squared which is minus. What's the imaginary part? Real times imaginary, real times imaginary added up. And so we still have our e to the a tagging along. All right. So we're going to let y1 simply be e to the at times only the real stuff, which is going to be the cosine bt times the real part of x minus sine bt times the imaginary part of x. And y2 is equal to e to the at times cosine bt times the imaginary part of x, which is the vector, plus sine bt times the real part of x. Where again, lambda is equal to a plus bi, and x is lambdas eigenvalue. Notice that this doesn't even write the, the fact that I actually have two solutions. I have lambda and lambda conjugate, right? 
I just use the fact that the Lambda Challenge you get is built into it. So I only need to find one because the other one is automatically built into the solution. All right. Now, if I look at this, you're like, well, kind of scratch your head a little bit. What was the point of all that? Let's go back to this example right here. We had this problem, and we had those, and we wrote it all as that particular solution, right? But now I don't, so I, before I just simply wrote it as a linear combination of needing both lambda and lambda one's conjugate and x one's conjugate, and I wrote it all out, and I write it, write it all like this, and this is y, and I, so I get these functions that have all of these i's in them, and I multiply it out, and I, it's like, but my problem is giving me solutions that are all real numbers. So I'm having a thing that has all this complex stuff. I'm going to have to take e to a complex power. I don't like interpreting it that way. On the other hand, the same solution doesn't need to be written with complex numbers. By simply rewriting our lambdas, I only need to find one of them. I don't need to find both. I could have two functions here. I could have, so my solution is going to be y1 written as a real solution is, well, for us, what's a? a is 1, right? So this is a plus bi. What's a? 1. What's b? 1. So this tells me that a is equal to 1. This tells me b is equal to 1. And this is the real component. This is the imaginary component. That means I could write my solution as what's y1? It's equal to e to the t times the cosine t multiplied by the real, which is 0, 2, minus sine t times the imaginary, which is 1, 1, and y2 was equal to e to the t, but now it is cosine t times 1, 1, plus sine t times the real component, 0, 2. And now all solutions are simply something times y1 plus something times y2. <coughs> but if I wanted to, I could take this thing, and this would look like what? This would be e to the t all times, that's a 0, that's a minus, so I'd have a minus sine t up top, that's a 2 cosine t, and that would be a 2 cosine t minus sine t in the bottom. And this is an e to the t times a cosine t up top and a cosine t plus 2 sine t. Sine t in bottom. Because cosine t times 0 is 0, cosine t times 2 is 2, cosine t, negative sine t times 1, negative sine t, so that goes here. So that just simply becomes a vector. So I just need a combination of those two. So it's just going to be c1 e to the t times this function minus sine t 2 cosine t minus sine t. And then plus c2 e to the t times the other function, which is cosine t and cosine t minus oops, plus 2 sine as one object. Now, I didn't know it's actually not showing you the bottom of the screen. It shows it on mine. What's the difference between this solution and the other one? Well, this is just all real numbers, right? Real numbers come in, real numbers come out. The other one is numbers went in, went into complex, the complex all multiply, and then eventually a real number comes out. It's kind of ugly looking. But this one, as long as we represent everything by sines and cosines with these exponentials, I get a solution that stays within real valued functions. 
And then if I was given at a particular value of t, I could find c1 and c2. So if it was an initial value problem, I could find it. So it's just really another memorization, which I won't make you memorize. It says, if you have one complex solution, you could write your two functions that, why do we have two functions? We have two functions because one complex solution actually represents two complex solutions. I just have to write it like this, which is a lot stranger looking than what we had before. Because before it was just simply e to the lambda t. Now it's e to the a t, which is the real part, with this thing along for the right. But that's all just simply complex algebra. So it's just another thing, essentially, that you can work with to write your solution in a different way. And the book covers one of those where they go through it. Most of the times in the book, when you when you see these, they just go, hey, look, here's the eigenvalue, here's the eigenvector. They give you the matrix, but I don't even have to give you the matrix. If I give you the eigenvalue, eigenvector, you know what the solutions are going to be. Any questions on at least writing it down? And these all work if they're linearly independent from each other. Okay, so how about, let's try, so we've, at, until now, we've solved y prime is equal to a y. Found eigenvalues, found their associated eigenvectors. And we know how to, we know what the solution is, it's exponential. We jump straight to the solution by just simply finding the eigenvalue eigenvectors of A. Uh, new problem. How many things in physics only deal with velocity? You've had, you've, you've had an awful lot of physics courses, right? What's the normal function that they give you? Do they give you the velocity function or do they normally talk about force? They not normally talk about force, right? Because force is an observable thing. You know, velocity is motion, right? It's moving. But force is what? Things that cause change in momentum, right? What's momentum? Momentum is the fact that you have something that it's mass and speed. It likes to just simply continue, right? Things in motion will continue to stay at motion. Things at rest will tend to stay at rest. Uh, how do you change that? Well, momentum is when you have things in motion, there are two things that are directly proportional to a concept, right? That it likes to do what it does. Mass. How many of you would want to get in front of a steamroller that's going down a hill and I ask you to please stand there and stop it? Or if I would roll a tennis ball down a hill and I say, please stand there and stop it, right? You would simply say, all right, it takes, I can stop this one because if the more mass there is, the harder this is going to be. But we have a, a second approach. I can simply say, I have a steamroller that's moving one millimeter per minute. Please stop it. And you're like, sure, I drop a pebble in front of it and it'll stop it. Right? But then I say, please stop a tennis ball moving at about... I don't know, make sure no air resistance so it actually can do this. And it's going about eh, 2,000 meters per second. It's like, now it's going to punch a hole right through me. Right? And so what do we know? Momentum, those are directly proportional. And so you simply say momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And then force is affecting this. Right? So when we say things like acceleration, force is equal to that whole mass times acceleration. Acceleration, when we talk about it, is this idea of changing mass velocity. Now, most of the time when we say force, sorry, the idea of force being changing mass velocity, a lot of times, well, mass is a constant. This is mass times change in velocity. That's mass times acceleration. Let's make sure my words are working right. This is, this is incorrect. Right? Changing mass velocity is correct. 
taking the derivative of mass and saying it's the constant is, is not something that's true. Because what, hap what one thing that I do, we do know, under observable effects, things with momentum, mass actually changes. The faster you go, the more mass you get. The slower you go, your mass approaches a constant. So mass is not a constant. It actually it's relativity, right? It's a feature of relativity. Now, typically for our normal observations, the fact that mass is changing is so trivial, we normally just simply call it a constant and then just pull it out of the derivative and then say it's mass times acceleration. But that's not true. Force is changing momentum. But changing momentum, velocity, is a change in position. So that means I have a second derivative. So most things that we run into in the world are not first derivative problems. <laughs> They're second derivative problems. And so let's say that we were approached with a second, a higher order. system of differential equations. And so what I'm asking you to do is I have some sort of connected thing going on. Uh, I have three springs and in between those springs are two masses and I grab the masses and then I just let them go and then I, I want to observe this, right? We have things that occur on it. We have functions that are working on positions and velocities and accelerations or second derivatives. And normally these would look like I am going, as a system, I have some sort of second derivative is a matrix times the position function and some other matrix times the first derivative or the velocity function, right? So we have something like this. Big technique in math is make new things old, right? Try to figure out if this is actually an old problem that's mixed up in a new package. And so for this, I want to find y, which is equal to some sort of, say, y1, y2, up to yn. And so solve means find these functions. How do I find these functions? Well, what we're going to try to do is turn this problem into that problem. And what, how we're going to do this is mm -hmm. I'm going to say we y itself is that and what I'm going to do is y prime, y prime is obviously y1 prime, y2 prime up to yn prime, right? That's y1 prime, y2 prime up to yn prime. But in the end, those are actually functions, right? You take a derivative of a function, you get a function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that these are functions. I'm going to say that this is yn plus 1 and yn plus 2 up to y2n. I'm going to treat them as if they're own, their own function. Then I'm going to make a new thing, which is I'm just going to stack them on top of each other. I'm going to say y1, y2, up to yn, and then I'm going to take yn plus 1 down to y2n, like that. I'm going to make this new group of functions that are twice as big. Now, if I would take this thing so I'm going to make a new vector of functions. Uh, let's just simply call this this new thing. Let's call him y say star. What would happen if I would take y star and then take its derivative? It would make y1 prime, y2 prime, up to yn prime, right? 
and then it would take y n plus one prime down to y two n prime. Pretty straightforward. But these are the first derivatives of my original functions that I'm interested in. What are these? So the top is y prime, right? But what's the bottom? y double prime. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the original functions, the first derivative of those original functions. And if I take the derivative of that, I now have what? The first derivatives and the second derivatives all in one vector. And now we're going to do, you're going to take a partition matrix multiply. If I take y prime, y double prime, I make this big matrix of all zeros, the identity, a1, a2, and I multiply this by y and then y prime, which is what y star is, right? y star is y's divided by y primes. That's just y star. What will that spit out? For partition multiplication, I take row one partition times this. What's the big O matrix times y? And so what would happen if I did this this becomes y prime, y double prime is big O times y plus i times y prime, and then what? a1y plus a2y prime. What's big O times anything? It's the all zero, right? This is just the all zero matrix, big O. And what's identity times y prime? So the top is y prime. And what's the bottom one? A1y plus A2y prime. By writing it this way, I've turned my problem into, well, wait a second. The first row it's just y prime equals y prime. Well, that's nothing big. But the second row is my actual problem. Okay, so that means to solve y double prime equals a1y plus a2y prime, all we have to do is, is to solve for this is a n by n problem, is to solve a 2n by 2n system that is simply written in the following way. Of a new, I'll call it, we'll call it y star prime is equal to 0 i a1 a2 y star. Where Our new y star is simply our old y followed by y prime, which is really just simply what we'll find is two n functions, which is going to be y1, y2, yn, yn plus 1, y2n, or these are just simply y1 prime down to yn prime. So if you want to solve a second order n by n, solve a first order 2n by 2n.
So if your old problem was a two by two system of equations, my new problem will be a four by four system of equations. But the functions, now this, this we can solve. How do I solve this? Find the eigenvalues. So this we can solve, right? This is just simply a derivative is equal to a big ma a matrix times a, a function. How do I solve this? I need the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that. And then I just put them in linear combination with each other. We can find eigenvalues so it's exactly the original problem. But when you solve it, your first half of your functions are the answer you're looking for. What's the second half of your functions going to always end up being? The derivatives of the things that you just found. But we still have to do the entire thing. I shouldn't make problems up off the top of my head, but oh well. So let's say I wanted you to solve y double prime is equal to crud, 1, 1, 0, minus 1 times y plus a 2, negative 1, negative 1, 3 times y prime. So if I want to solve that, means what? How do I solve the bigger system? Solve y star prime is equal to what? What's my bigger matrix going to be? What's the upper left? All zeros. What's the upper right? The identity and then the two matrices. So these go from two by twos. I just take this and write zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, 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 zero, minus one, two, minus one, negative one, three, all times y, whatever that is. How do I solve this? Well, this thing is called what? A. So what are the solutions? Do what? A's eigenvalues and vectors. And what are you going to find? You're going to find lambda 1 with x1. You are going to find lambda 2 and x2. You will find lambda 3 and x3. And you will find lambda 4 and x4. We have to find those. How do you find them? I don't want to find it, sorry. <laughs> I don't even know if this is actually a good problem because they have to be all linearly independent. And so, well, actually, what is that? Do, do, do. So, octave. Ah, I didn't want the graphical octave. There we go. So I want A to be equal to 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, minus 1, and 0, negative 1, negative 1, 3. So that's my A. And then... Just i gay. Those are the eigenvalues. If I do a c c d, I think I can store it like that. There we go. So, and then what it does is it puts the the eigenvalues that it found along the diagonal of this, and this would be the vector, 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 vector associated. And so that would be c. We could check to see if C is linearly independent. Just sign-wise, it looks like they are linearly independent because of the plus-minus motion, if I had to rough guess. So then what would I do with those numbers? Oh, we don't see the bottom? Sorry. I would take it's a constant times E to the 3.36234T times that first vector, plus a constant times E to the so we just go through here and say it's a constant e to that power t times this vector 
and then e to that power t, the second vector, e to the this power t times the third vector, e to the this power t times the fourth vector, linear combination is your solution. Right? But if I would take all those things and stuff them into one big vector, which we could, right? And we could find the constants by having an initial value problem of initial positions and initial velocities. We could find the four constants, right? The top two are the functions, the bottom two would be the what? The velocities of the system. In the end, it makes it exactly like the problem that we had before. We just have to nest it into a twice as large system. Kind of interesting that I just made things up and it came up with real solutions. I wouldn't want to do that one better. Questions on that? So the C there are your the C is the collection of the eigenvectors. Right? And normally, you know, you look at that and say, well, this, this looks pretty horrific. And the answer is, well, yeah, it's just it's a, it's a systematic way. And again, it's in the direction of this, right? So I can multiply this vector by anything that I want to get a vector, right? And a lot of times you do that to try and get out integer solutions. I don't know if these are rational or irrational. I have no idea. You probably want to use a system like uh, Maxima, Mathematica, Maple, MuPad, symbolic solvers that would give you like square roots and stuff like that if you want, or if it's integer or rational. Okay.